All right. So good to see all of you in the house of the Lord this morning. You're looking beautiful and handsome. And if you're looking both simultaneously, you have problems. You're rather confused. Last week this time we were kind of uh, finishing up our golf tournament. We had a wonderful time and we had a nice opportunity to spend with uh, Phil and Judy Jaquith. Pastor Phil really preached a, a great message last week, Seed Time and Harvest. I've been thinking about it all week uh, after he spoke that message, just the beauty of the fact that we can give energy into positive things in our life. How many of you know that you can really quit if everything is immediate, demanding, and it's all or nothing? And it's better to incrementally change. And so I've been meditating on that. Well, this week, it's Bible College Week. We've had a, a neat thing. Uh, Brother Bill Scheidler and Joanne Scheidler, last Sunday night, some of you. All you guys that helped move the Scheidlers last week, would you guys stand up? Some of you young guys, yeah. Yeah, they were, they helped. They only broke, you know, a number of things. It wasn't more than like three or $4,000 worth. But uh, it's so good to have Bill and Joanne. They've moved to Eagle Point. And uh, Bill and Joanne uh, have a Bible college that, and, and training uh, under BillScheider.com. You can see it. And uh, material, what was it, about 20,000 people that were uh, receiving your material internationally? Was that Bill? It was higher now. So it's, it's really crazy. Well, Bill and Joanne are here, and then today we have our good friend, Dr. Stan DeCoven, who is the president of Vision International, and he's all over the world as well. And he goes to all kinds of places. His name is Dr. Stan DeCoven, and, and one way to make sure he'll come to your nation is name it Stan, like Pakistan. Uzbekistan, Turkestan, Kazakhstan, and, uh, and so uh, I love what, what uh, Dr. Stan DeCoven does, and uh, I believe he's spoken here before. How many of you remember Dr. Stan? Great communicator, and so today is like Bible College Day. It also is fitting for all the graduations, and I remember when I graduated from high school, night school, how much it meant to me you know, to get out of, uh, out of that program. But anyway, let's welcome Dr. Stan DeCoven with the great Southern Oregon welcome. Thanks, Bishop. Good morning. It's an honor to be here, to be able to share the word. And uh, what a lovely weather. We went out and played golf yesterday. I think that's what we were doing. We were chasing a ball around a little bit, yeah, but, but anyway, it's wonderful to be here. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 12. I want to get right into the message, because i got a lot to cover. I think we have a PowerPoint. We're going to have that up there in a moment, and um, I call this a five-fold message, because there's five points, that's all. I had to give it a title, but it's also titled, Now Grace. So we're in Romans chapter 12. We're going to read a few verses of Scripture there, starting with verse 1. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, that would also be sisters, I guess, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Turn page. <clears throat> For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we through many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in portion to your faith, if service, in our serving, the one who teaches, in his teaching, the one who exhorts, in his exhortation, the one who contributes, in generosity, the one who leads, with zeal, 
the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Uh, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought and do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, thanks, Lord, for this morning. It's a good day. It's a good day. As my mama used to say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, because when you complain, nobody listens anyway. So, Lord, I just pray that uh, this message will uh, come forth in power and anointing, or at least it'll say something to somebody that'll help them. That would be a good thing, Lord. So may this be a blessed morning. It already is. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for great worship. Thank you, Lord, for even an incredible offering. That was a great exhortation. We pray again, blessing on each one in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I love the writings of Paul, the apostle. He was a unique fella, obviously one who was passionate about the things of God. He was passionate bad, he's passionate good, he was always passionate. Sometimes I think as you read about the life of Paul, he was not always the most um, uh, kind person, so maybe would be one way to say it. He wasn't always as considerate as some people might like. He wasn't always that pastoral. Um, he could be pretty rough at times, but he was so passionate for his mission that 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 was the focus pretty much of his life. He was after the mission of God. And as he grew, as we all grow, thank God for growth, we all change over time, hopefully for the better. Over time, you can kind of see, even in the writings of Paul, he began to change a bit. Relationships became much more important to him than being right. And that, I think, is an important thing, as you read Paul, you begin to recognize that, that the relationships he had were so precious to him. Even though, again, in the very early part of his ministry, the mission was seemingly more important than people. But you know, when you read the writings of Paul, one of the things you'll notice is that he never tells people what to do until he first tells them who they are. He never tells them what to do until he first affirms in them who they really are. And as such, he, he's, um, his focus was always on making sure that, that people were encouraged before he slapped them. You know, good pastoral ministry does that, you know. You're just wonderful, you rat bags. So what we're reading here is Paul's kind of end of his letter, reminding them of what their responsibility should be. But if you spent time in the earlier part of the book, you would recognize he spent a lot of time trying to remind them of who they are and why they are now capable of doing everything that he says you can now do. It's not based upon your goodness or badness. It's based upon the goodness of God and the power of his spirit, which now resides within you. Hallelujah for that. So let me just talk about this a little bit, the now grace of God. Because now that we have received all blessings in Christ by his grace, you all recognize you've received all blessings in Christ by his, right? You, you know you already have that. 
is not something you have to fight for. Right? It's something that you have received because Christ paid the price for it. Uh, because you've overcome sin, sin natures overcome because when you, when Christ died, you died, right? Right? Your sin was nailed to the cross. So since you've overcome sin in Christ, now then you stop and think, but wait a minute, I still struggle with all kinds of things. <laughs> My life is miserable. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> But we have overcome because we are overcomers in him. Because we've been forever forgiven, we've come to the new Jerusalem. We're saved, sanctified, glorified in Christ, having died in him, buried in him, raised in him, ascended in him, and seated with him in the heavenlies, which is where we are right now. Welcome to heaven. Now, not the heaven the place that we will all go to eventually when we die. But we're in the heavenly realm right here, right now. We're in his presence. Didn't we sing that? And the Bible seems to indicate that we are presently seated in the heavenlies with Christ. We're seated with Christ. Where is Jesus seated? Right hand of the Father. How difficult is it to get the Father's attention? <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. He's right there. Hello. That's a good thing, isn't it? We can come boldly before his throne. It's not that difficult. He's right next door. And since we are free in him, in union, for the purpose of communion at all times, since we've received everything in terms of eternal life through Christ, because we're victors, heirs, of the better covenant with better promises because we're loved, we're accepted, we're affirmed, we're precious, we're chosen, we're holy. Somebody better get happy in here. Come on. These are not things that you strive for. These are things that you've received in Christ. Which is pretty good news, I think. Because we're filled with faith. For every day is filled with life and light in him. This is the day the Lord has made. I really am everything that you've said that I am, Lord. Now what? See, the problem for most of us is the now what? I mean, if we can get that part, that's a great foundation. That's an incredible start in terms of our walk with God, if we can get that, that I really am loved, that I really am accepted, that I've been set aside for God for his purpose, that the Spirit of God is within me, that nothing shall separate me from the love of God. If I can get that, what a wonderful foundation that is. And it's one of the greatest problems that most Christians have is simply getting that. That's why Paul emphasized it over and over and over. Can you get that? All that, understand all that Christ has done for you. If you can get that, then you can work on the now what? Then you can begin to work on Romans 12 a bit. Present yourself. You're a special presentation to God, you know. Isn't it wonderful to know that he's just excited to have you in his presence? Think about that for a moment. You know, he didn't create another one of you. He didn't want another one of you. Because you are enough. I mean that in the most positive way, even though you're taking it in the most realistic and perhaps negative way. And he simply says... Will you come here? Will you just come here? Just be in my presence. Just present yourself. Just the way you are. Don't try and dress up. Don't try and learn some special Christianese that will somehow pry open the door of heaven so that I will pour out my blessings on you. Yeah. 
I don't care about that. I'm not interested in that. Just come here. Because I love you the way you are. No but, 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 no. Just come. Submit to him. That's your worship. Our highest worship is submit to him. Submit to him. It's not how well we sing. Singing is great. Music is wonderful. It's a blessing. Especially if you can sing on key and play well. It's a blessing. But that's not the issue. Present yourself. Here I am, Lord. Aren't you glad to see me? And the Lord would say, you bet. Where you been? I love it when you're in my presence, says the Lord. So stop struggling. Rest. It's not about our plans. It's not about our future. It's, not, it, it's all about, well, I'd say it's all about him, but that isn't true. It's all about us. It's him and us. So he wants you simply to change your mind. Present your body, renew your mind, change your mind, repent. Repent of what? Stupid would be good. <laughs> if you're doing stupid, it would be good to change your mind about that. Okay. Whatever needs to be changed. You, you, you probably know already the things that need to be changed. If you don't and you're married, ask your spouse. If you're not married, ask one of your best friends, and if they're honest with you, they'll tell you. And perhaps, if you're really sensitive, ching, ching, to the Holy Ghost, he'll tell you too. Okay? Read the Word sometime, shows you things, and then change your thinking. Because as long as you got stinking thinking, you can never move forward in what God wants for you. Now, please remember, you're already accepted. You're already loved. You're already in the family. You're in the house. Nobody's kicking you out. Rest in that. Rest in that. Be assured of that. But at the same time, grow up. Grow up. He wants mature sons, which is both men and women. He wants mature sons. They're the ones that get stuff done. So he wants us to become fully aware, even more God conscious than before. See, so often we're so sin conscious that we cannot be God conscious. God is not worried about our sin. In fact, I don't think he gets nervous when we sin. I don't think he falls down and dies. I don't think he rolls off his throne. I don't think he rolls his eyes in the back. Oh, my goodness, can you see that? I can't believe that. What morons they are. They're sinning again. I don't think it phases the Father. He says, of course they're going to sin. You're going to miss the mark. You're going to make mistakes. Come here. We'll work on that. If you'll just stay close, if you'll just stay in my word, if you'll just stay faithful, we'll get through it. You'll grow up. Become God conscious. And then walk his will. That is, every day, the best you can, you live out righteousness, peace, joy. You live out the kingdom the best you can. Now, but in order to do that, of course, it takes grace. Grace. Grace is a great word. Grace and then more grace. That's the only thing that makes it possible. Without the grace of God, none of us are going to make it in terms of fulfilling our destiny in him. But he's got plenty of grace. Our relationship with God started with grace. By grace we're saved, right? Through faith. And even faith is a gift. So you didn't have a whole lot to do with it. You don't have to take a lot of credit for it, nor blame. Here you are, you're in the house, praise God. By grace, he has his favor. Now, we don't just live according to the grace of God given to us by the cross, but also his continuous grace in our life. Every day we wake up, we take a deep breath, grace. God is with us. Wherever we go, there he is. His grace is there with us. Wherever, whatever, as we live out our life, and that's what God wants us to do, live out your life by grace. In order to do that, you need to have a positive self-appraisal. Paul words it this way, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. But he also is saying, don't think less of yourself than you should. Have an honest appraisal of yourself. You're not the great man of God 
or the great woman of God. There are no great men and great women of God. There's a great God that men and women serve. God is great. The rest of us are doing the best we can. But we have something. We have something in God. We are somebody, each of us, uniquely made, created in the image of God. God wants us to recognize I am not an ordinary person. Stop looking at me like that. I don't mean we're strange and weird, although some of you probably are. Again, if you're not sure, ask your neighbor, they'll tell you. But as fearfully and wonderfully made creation of God, we need to recognize I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Again, an honest appraisal is very important about who you are. We need to write our thinking. Rather than having the stinking thinking that keeps us repeating the same patterns over and over again, we need to make sure that our mind gets set on the things that are above, not the things that are on the earth. Because God has given us a measure of faith, and everyone's measure is different. And thank God that we don't have to go around measuring each other. There's a lot of folks that do that. A lot of folks, a lot of preachers especially do that. They spend a lot of time saying, I can do better than that. And perhaps they could. But if they could, maybe they should. But if they're not on the platform, they should shut up. Hello. I mean, the reality is, reality is, God's given us all a measure of faith. Just enough faith necessary for us to fulfill what he's called us to do. And all we're responsible for is to live out that measure of faith by his grace. If you serve, serve to the best of your ability with a smile on your face. Your reward is great in heaven. If you're a leader, lead with zeal. Be passionate about your leadership. Don't stand back and wait for the committee to decide what we should do. If you're a leader, get out front and lead and take the bullets that come. Go for it in Jesus' name. Whatever your area of service is, and Paul's just given a sample of them here, recognize he's given you the faith to make it happen. More than enough to activate the gifts we have. And why do we have these gifts anyway? It's always for the benefit of others, isn't it? So if God's given you this great measure of faith and you're keeping it to yourself, it's worthless. It's only to bless others. And that's what we need to seek because part of growing up is to become less and less self-focused. Oh God, when am I going to get a word? Oh, God, when am I going to have someone prophesy great things for my future? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Get over it. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. Because our ministry is for the benefit of others. Not to be self-absorbed about what we've got or don't have. What a waste of energy. If you're self-absorbed, return to door number one. Receive grace. Okay. And then Paul goes on to say, listen, brothers and sisters, would you get real? Get real with each other. Genuine affection for each other. Genuine affection for each other is a demonstration that God has done something in your life. When you come to church and you see someone that, well, I've just, I've seen them for the last 300 Sundays. But when I see them again, I can't wait to smile and wrap my arms around them and tell them how much I love them and how important they are, not just to God and not just in his kingdom, but how important you are to me. Just seeing you lifts my spirit. Genuine affection. I mean, sometimes we, we're a little reticent to share our feelings, our emotions with each other, and I understand that. But one of the things that Paul recognized was important, especially for the church in Rome, is that they learn how to share this, this holy kiss with each other. 
that, that say, listen, you're, you're so important in my life. I just have to tell you how, how great you are. Genuine affection. Warm affection. That's what Paul expected. And he knew that they could do that because of who they are in Christ, of all that God has done for them, about the reality that they're chosen, holy, beloved. So genuine affection, love in action, but without Christianese, please. So often, oh, God bless you, brother. You look so wonderful today, glory to Jesus. Really, I put on a little weight, didn't you notice? I mean, you know, you don't mind me a little fat. I guess that's all right. Thank you. You look fantastic. Well, thank you so much. You need glasses. I mean, you know, we need to hang on to what's good. I mean, I, th I don't look. When your wife asks you, do I look good in this dress, what is your answer? Absolutely. You look better in this dress than anyone I've ever seen in that dress. <laughs> or out of it, for that matter. <clears throat> so you want to hang on to what's good. Hang on to what's good. Grab a hold of it. What's good? What is good? What does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? What is it we need to grab a hold of and hold on to? Paul recognized there's a lot of things that come within our grasp that we might want to grab a hold of, but it will take us in the wrong direction. Hold on to the things that are good. You know, there's three words in theology that we use to talk about you know, how we should live. There's orthodoxy, you know, which is right doctrine. There's also orthopraxis, which is right action or right behavior. But there's also orthopathy, which is right feeling. One of the things about being a part of a charismaniac church <laughs> is that right feeling is also very important. Joy, love, and the expression of those things is very important. That's why we do love his presence. Because in his presence is the fullness of joy. Hang on to the things that are good. Show honor. Show honor. I wish, really, not in a jealousy way, but in many ways, I wish I could pastor a church like this. But I recognize there's someone with a greater grace to pastor a work like this. There's a person with a greater grace. And because of that, of course, because he has greater grace, he's able to make room for guys like me to come and share. I appreciate it very much. I mean, but I honor the grace, the gift. Because I recognize that whoever has a gift in any area and they're exercising that gift, their gift is greater than my gift and I should rejoice in that and show honor to it. So when I see anybody serving in any capacity, loving on someone, stopping to pray for someone, I said, oh, God, thank you. Bless that person in their gift. And I want to honor the gift of God. Paul recognized the importance of honor. Now, he was not seeking honor for himself. He wasn't worried about that. He wasn't saying, by the way, you should remember I'm the apostle. Notice Paul never called himself Apostle Paul. It was Paul, an apostle, a sent one. That's it. Just in case there's another Paul out there, I want you to know I'm the one that was sent. That's it. He wasn't into titles. He wasn't into degrees. He wasn't into any of that kind of stuff. He was simply into grace. God's favor, God's power, God's glory being manifested in God's people. And part of how we do that in each other is by honoring each other in our words as well as our actions. He wanted them to get zeal, grow up. So important. And then, oh, I'm doing okay here. I'm, I'm, I still have time. Hmm, maybe I should take a break.
I would love one, really. Yeah. No, that's all right. What does he talk about zeal? Zeal is really a passion to see the things of God done. It's one of the things that many preachers lose over time. Because we, we labor and we labor and we don't always see the fruit that we'd like to see. Although in reality, when we stop and think about it, we realize that our influence may never be seen until we're in heaven. We, we don't know what our real influence is. When we write a book or develop a sermon or speak to a certain individual at a, at a given time or season, it may so transform somebody's life that they take off and do great for, things for God, and we get some of the glory of that. We never know. But it's important never to lose your passion. You don't want to lose your passion. I mean, coming into the house, worshiping God, don't lose your passion. Keep that zeal. The zeal for souls is almost lost in the church in America. It's like we don't hardly care about the lost. Don't they deserve to be lost anyway? No. We pray, oh God, wipe out our enemies. Glory to Jesus. And Jesus says, don't wipe them out. Bring them to me. I'll transform them by my power. People think, oh, the Muslims, horrible. No, most of them are family people trying to do the best they can. They don't understand God and the gospel and all that. But when they come to know Jesus, they're the most fantastic believers you'd ever find. They're passionate for God. As is anyone that was steeped in sin when they're transformed by the power of God. And we must have that zeal. Perhaps now more than ever. And God wants us simply to grow up. So it, part of learning to grow up is we've got to learn to take a punch. Because in reality... There's going to be people that don't like you. I remember my, my dad told me years ago, I said, there's going to be about 10% of the people that no matter what you say or do, they're going to like you. If you but don't hang around them because they don't have a clear perspective on reality. <laughs> there's also going to be about 10% of the people that no matter what, they're not going to like you. Don't hang out with them either because although they may have a clear perspective on reality, they're no fun to be with. It's the 80%, those in the middle, that we have an option of learning how to love them and, and, and presenting our best self to them in, so that we can have true relationship. Okay. Paul was very concerned in the church in Rome that they learned to live at peace, if at all possible. And it's not always easy, especially if you're married to a nag or nagger. It's a terrible thing to be to be in a relationship with someone that's negative all the time. So trying to find a place of peace, sometimes that's why, that's why people play golf. Go on boats, take trips, get away. Need a little time away. But it's almost impossible to constantly live at peace, and yet Paul said, do it. You can only by grace. By the grace of God, when you recognize that probably the person that just flipped you off as you were driving down the freeway was having a bad day. To return in kind is not necessary and not nice. Tempting, of course. Satisfying without question. But we're supposed to avoid that because we're Christians. Yeah. <laughs> But it's possible to live in peace. Give them the one-way sign instead of the modified one-way sign. <laughs> Pray blessing on them. Now, when we read that it might heap coals of burning embers on their head, we're thinking, yeah. Light them up, God. Hallelujah. <laughs> but that's not what Paul was saying. I mean, you know, they would carry it, like literally give someone coals so they can go start their own fire and warm them. 
Bless them. Oh, to do that takes maturity. When someone criticizes you to bless them instead of criticizing back, that takes maturity. That's not easy to do. It's also not fun to do. And yet, Paul said, one of the results of your maturity is instead of cursing, you bless. Instead of taking vengeance, you express the love of God. Now, he says, the reality is, of course, Romans, Medfordians, you can't do this. It's not possible in yourself. It's totally impossible outside of grace. And so every day I get up and say, Lord, I need your grace. <laughs> I need your grace. I need your grace. But then I usually change the prayer. From I need your grace, give me your grace, I want it, I want it too. Thank you, Lord. I have your grace. It's already been given to me. Lord, today, help me to walk it out. I mean, just walk it out to the best of my ability, knowing that you are with me because I've already received everything I need. I just need to live like a son. I need to live as an overcomer. Because that is who we are in Christ by grace. And it's really how we know that we're reaching a place of maturity in him. Bishop? Thank you. I was uh, listening to that message and I thought, this changes my preaching calendar. Uh, we're going to show this video for the next 20 weeks. And uh, so it'll be a easier for my schedule. Wow. Fantastic. Fantastic. Just a shout out for Archive YouTube. JCF Live, this will be uploaded, and I really recommend that, that every one of us occasionally would reference this teaching session and keep ourselves dosed with that empowerment message. Amen. Let's all stand together if we could. Wow. One of the neatest things that happens week after week is the fact that people come to God's house with that sense of desire. You know, I think of over the years when I've needed a product, whether it be a pair of shoes, I would usually go to a shoe store to, to get some help and, and have uh, maybe a salesperson begin to uh, show me the products they have there. Or if I was looking for fishing gear, I might go to a sports store and, and begin to inquire as to what's available. Many, many people week after week, they come to God's house, not just here at Joy, but also Christian churches all over the world. Because the Bible teaches that we all, we come as offspring of Adam. We, we are born into the human race but nobody just gravitates into becoming a child of God. It's a decision and it's a spiritual birthing, which oftentimes comes as a desire. God begins to put in our spirit a hunger to believe and to deal with the fact that maybe there's something more than just living as an existentialist, just living in this life and eating and breathing and interacting and then you die and you just are gone. The Bible teaches that in the beginning, God, God the primary cause, he himself uncaused, God began to speak and all of that which we can interact with what began to appear, light, the waters, the land upon the waters, the heavens, 
the birds, the plants, the animals, the minerals. The physical universe was created by this God who created his number one prize creation was mankind. And he said, I want to have man make him in my own image that I can have fellowship with him, that he can have dominion and he can live with me in great relationship. And so we find that it only took us two extra chapters from chapter one and chapter three was the fall of man where Satan came in and he seduced man's mind and we turned away from God. And every child born after the fall was born into sin. We were born with an inclination to live our own life and do our own thing. But yet God in his mercy had sent forth a payment. He had planned for that payment before the foundation of the world. So the Bible says that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. And so before we were ever inv invented or created, God had already had provision in mind. So that when we turned away from God, we wouldn't be left as orphans and we wouldn't be left without hope. Most people that I meet have a sense of impending doom. Many people have a sense that something's wrong. And it's easy to try to psych yourself and say nothing's wrong. The Bible said there is something wrong. The Bible says that the whole earth is groaning for the manifestation of God's family, of his sons. That sense that I need something is a valid cry. It's a valid sense. So week after week, we see people come here and they don't know exactly what they need. But as we begin to worship God, they begin to feel an alien presence. They feel the presence of God. And week after week, there are people who come to join God and just say, I want, I want to be a part of his family. The Bible tells us that the payment was made by Jesus. This sacrifice was paid, that we could have peace with God. We could leave being just a part of the family of man, and then we are transformed by his forgiveness to become a, a part of the family of God. And so it's a two-step phase. You're born as a human, but you must be born again to be a child of God. So as we've been speaking and worshiping, not only here live, but also people, various parts of the country or world that are watching the live stream and those that'll see the archive. The Bible says if you will call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. And that he comes to take away your shame. If you call upon the name of the Lord, he'll take away your shame. And so today, I would like to invite every one of you that came into this place, or those of you who are watching, if you came with a desire to receive a change of life, that comes by receiving the Lord. And so what do we ask you to do? Just step out of your chair right now, very quickly, leave your chair, come down and stand in front of these people. And what we want to do is pray. Let's all keep coming, y'all. I believe there are more folks here that you would like to just become a child of God. God is so good. Oftentimes we say, please come to the Father that will love you more than anything you've ever imagined or felt. This Father will never abandon you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Last call, if you're here, also to you that are watching the live stream, as we pray, pray this prayer and receive the power of God. You are Then you can uh, uh, email us or anything that you want to do for greater uh, training, teaching, and we'll do our best to get you rigged up at, so you can walk successfully with the Lord. How many think it's exciting when you see people call on the Lord? Amen. Amen. Okay. Just make a little circle down here, you guys. Make a little circle. We're going to pray this prayer. 
I like to pray this prayer every week because I like reminding God that I'm in. I, I love God. I want, I want His salvation, even though I've been a Christian for a long time. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Father, I thank you for your incredible love. The Bible says that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whoever believes on you would be saved. Thank you, Father. This day, I call on your mercy. I ask you to forgive me. Lord, you know me. You know me at my best. You've known me at my worst. You've loved me. I ask you, God, forgive me of every sin. Change my heart. Change my mind. Make me new on the inside. I'm calling on you. You said that if I call, you would save me. You also said, if I would call, you would take away shame, and I would not be ashamed. Take my shame, I'm calling today. If you'll be my father, I'll be your child. If you'll be my God, I'll be your servant. I receive you today, dear Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 This morning, the angels of heaven are rejoicing. Wow. I'd like to pray with the rest of us. I'm not tired of learning from the word. I don't believe that I have it all. And I think you're the same way. I need God's grace in my life. I want to retain strong zeal. You know, someone asked me recently, Pastor, what can I pray for you? I said, pray that I'll be baptized with my first love. Let's lift our hands together. Could we pray? How many of you believers say, you know, I could use a dose of some grace, some first love? I just feel that the love of God just being spread abroad today upon God's people. Sometimes, you know, we just have to just <laughs> lay back and just say, God, it's you. It always has been. And it always will be. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, I pray for everyone here. I pray that you'd pour out your grace. Lord, I pray that you'd pour out your power through the Holy Spirit. You are, you are our God. You're our hope. You're our strength. You are very present help in time of need. And today, Lord, I just sense you allowing your children to just put their head upon your chest. I pray that every mountain would be moved from the front of your people. Every giant would be displaced and defeated. Every, every battle, every struggle, Father, we thank you that the victory is in you, dear God. I pray, Lord, that you would baptize your people with your power, your grace. Hallelujah. Pray this with me, dear Father. I receive your divine enablement. Lord, I've received mercy, and I'll continue to receive mercy. But I thank you that I also receive your grace that not only am I being rescued, but I am being built. I'm not wh where I will be, but I'm not where I used to be. 
thank you, Father, for your power, your enablement to do those tasks, to be that person who functions in your call according to your plan. You, Lord, are the wind. I lift up my sail. Help me, Lord, to accomplish your task as I worship you and praise you with all my heart, speaking this in Jesus' name, amen.